Ja, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Wolfgang Knöbel, ich bin der Leiter des Hamburger Instituts für Sozialforschung und ich begrüße Sie jetzt fast schon, würde ich sagen, wie immer zu einer etwas ungewöhnlichen Veranstaltung, weil nicht das HIS hier Veranstalter ist, sondern der Arbeitskreis für moderne Sozialgeschichte, der hier seit einiger Zeit tagt. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass der Arbeitskreis wieder hier ist. Ich begrüße auch alle Mitglieder, die hier sind. Und will auch gar keine sozusagen weiteren Reden schwingen, will eigentlich nur sagen, der Arbeitskreis für moderne Sozialgeschichte ist in den 1950er Jahren gegründet worden von namhaften Historikern und Historikerinnen, hat eine ganz lange Tradition. Es gab damals keine Frauen, ich, ich gebe es zu, ich gebe es zu. Gut, von Historikern, mittlerweile gibt es Frauen im Arbeitskreis, unglaublicherweise, ähm, ähm, wir freuen uns natürlich sehr, dass der Arbeitskreis hier diesen Ort gewählt hat und wir haben dadurch, dass der Arbeitskreis hier ist, immer auch die Möglichkeit, tolle Vorträge zu organisieren und hier im Haus zu haben. Und wir haben heute einen tollen Vortrag. Ich werde allerdings den Vortragenden Alexei Müller nicht vorstellen. Das macht Stefan Berger von der Universität Bochum. Er ist Professor für neuere Geschichte, sagte glaube ich selber gleich für Sozialgeschichte. <lacht> er wird den heutigen Vortragenden äh, vorstellen und ich freue mich ganz sehr auf den Vortrag. Ja, besten Dank, äh, Wolfgang, äh, für die Einführung. Äh, ich freue mich auch, dass äh, so viele gekommen sind. Äh, herzlich willkommen für Mitglieder des Arbeitskreises und für alle anderen hier. Äh, und ich will nur ein paar Worte sagen. Alexei Miller äh, dürfte vielleicht auch den meisten bekannt sein, ist äh, Professor für Geschichte an der Europäischen Universität in äh, St. Petersburg und zugleich ähm, ein äh, äh, Professor an der Central European University in, äh, in Budapest. Äh, er ist einer der führenden Experten der äh, Geschichte des äh, Russischen äh, Reiches im äh, langen 19. Jahrhundert, hat dazu sehr viel veröffentlicht, äh, zahlreiche Bücher auf Russisch und auf Englisch. Vielleicht sozusagen kann ich nur erwähnen, ähm, die Bücher äh, Uh, the Ukrainian Question, The Russian Empire and Nationalism in the 19th Century uh, und das andere Buch, uh, The Romanov Empire and Nationalism, jeweils erschienen bei der Central European University Press. Um, er hat sich sozusagen intensiv mit uh, diesen Fragen von um, Imperium und Nationsbildung beschäftigt. Uh, vielleicht darf ich unbescheidenerweise auch noch äh, erwähnen, dass wir zusammen äh, 2015 einen Band herausgegeben haben, Nationalizing Empires, der sich genau mit diesem Thema beschäftigt. Aber er hat auch seit vielen Jahren sich mit der Geschichtspolitik äh, Russlands und auch des zeitgenössischen Russlands beschäftigt und hat immer wieder auch äh, über zeitgenössische politische und gesellschaftliche Fragen sich geäußert. Ist also Hervorragend geeignet, heute Abend äh, diesen Vortrag zu halten und ich freue mich sehr. Alexei. Thank you very much for invitation and thank you very much for coming. Uh, none of this previous research has anything to do with what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, <clears throat> so let us begin in 1987. That was the 70th anniversary of uh, the Great October Socialist Revolution. And <clears throat> uh, the most influential and popular thick journal, you know, we used to have thick journals in Russia, uh, <clears throat> not anymore. Uh, the New World, Novi Mir, uh, published a short article, or rather an essay, written by um, an economist or economic uh, publicist, uh, Larisa Piyasheva, and the title of the essay was Where Cakes Are Better. And uh, <clears throat> the argument was very simple. Uh, you cannot be mm, a bit pregnant, uh, either planned economy or market. Uh, market will make everybody better off, but some will become much, much more better off than the others. And the question or concern of Piyasova was, uh, 
Are we prepared as society based on egalitarian principles for this rise of inequality? Uh, so this belief was shared uh, by the majority that market is going to bring some sort of prosperity for everybody. Now, here you have a picture which shows you the reality. You have Russian GDP coming down for 10 years, and uh, the scale of decline is uh, 44%. So we come to um, uh, the same level as in 89, only by uh, 2007. Uh, uh, if you look at countries of so-called Central Europe, uh, they also had a decline. But this decline lasted for five years, and the scale was approximately 25%. Uh, it is not only quantitative, but it is also qualitative difference. Because uh, if you have, uh, say, economy like Polish, with some sort of private trade, uh, private property uh, of land, uh, and you have five-year decline of 25%, hard times, but you somehow model through. If you have a decline of 44% for 10 years, that means that your life is broken. Families are broken. Your plans for future are broken. Your professional orientation, professional choices are not valid anymore. <coughs> uh, the group which suffered probably most of all was the group which was most active in supporting Perestroika, and that was uh, educated strata, because they lost their jobs and usually uh, found their uh, new self-fulfillment in trading cheap Chinese goods in uh, Russian markets. Uh, 14 republics left the USSR with zero debt. All the debt was taken by Russia. Practically, that was a forced move, but compensated by the promise, partly fulfilled, that some of this debt is going to be alleviated. So, <clears throat> our current Russian socio-economic reality is a result, of course, partly of Soviet time but mostly is the result of transition of 1990s. Between 1988-89 and 1992-93, so these four years, uh, the number of poor in Russia jumped from uh, two million people to 74 million people, approximately 50%. This is the data of World Bank uh, from 1998. So, transformation failed to support educated strata. Uh, some people emigrated, some people died, some people uh, simply had to trade uh, goods, uh, <clears throat> this transformation failed to create a mass shareholding. We had something which was called privatization. Uh, some other countries uh, also had uh, something which was called privatization. These were two very different things. If you look at, say, Czech experience of privatization, uh, practically uh, 
it was a very carefully organized process which in reality created this uh, shareholding, mass shareholding, uh, and allowed some distribution of public wealth among individuals. Uh, in Russia, that was a kind of a, well, very well organized robbery. Uh, because um, everybody got so-called vouchers, which uh, had practically no value, particularly for those people who were not connected to big enterprises. In big enterprises, people were allowed to buy uh, stakes of their uh, uh, shares in their own enterprises, which was a reasonable move on the side of so-called red directors, who later became capitalists, uh, uh, simply because they knew that they will uh, have loyal workers, and later they can buy the shares back uh, in a reasonable way, protecting themselves from a hostile takeover. All the rest basically had no chances to invest properly. So what happened, uh, people were offered an opportunity to sell uh, their vouchers, and the price for which these vouchers was sold equaled approximately to 10 bottles of vodka. Uh, now, mm, entrepreneurial gentlemen amassed packages of these vouchers and started privatization. Now, to understand how it was all organized, you have to realize that until now, until today, nobody knows how these packages of vouchers uh, were uh, registered and utilized. And there is no data which allows to check this. What does it mean? You have a package of vouchers like 300, 3,000, 30,000. Uh, you use them to privatize something. What happens to these papers? They might come back to you so that you can use them for privatization of yet another object. So, uh, we have still no, absolutely no data uh, where these vouchers ended and how. Uh, <clears throat> so within 10 years, uh, Russia moved from more or less um, egalitarian structure to the system in which uh, inequality fits very well the Latin American pattern. Uh, we got a situation in which approximately from 45 to 47% of income comes to top 20%. This situation emerged in uh, early 1990s. It didn't change at all until now. Uh, plus, we got um, a special operation conducted in late 90s when huge steel uh, non-privatized uh, state enterprises, particularly related to uh, um, natural resources, were privatized uh, um, among those people who supported the second electoral campaign of President Yeltsin. Uh, so, summing up uh, what I've said by now is that we started uh, with uh, a belief that uh, capitalism is going to make everybody richer that 
capitalism is about fair competition. Uh, and the main problem is how we live with uh, inequality, uh, being everybody better off. We ended up with a situation of tremendous decline, which resulted in tremendous <clears throat> social losses. Uh, and basically, uh, one of the big problems of, well, people who still call themselves liberals in Russia today is that they insist that 1990s were a good time. Uh, the overwhelming majority has different memories. These memories include these two lines. The red one is the rate of suicide. And the blue one is the rate of homicide. So, it's not only the rate of uh, suicide, and you can see how dramatic it is, but it is also uh, the emergence of this phenomenon which was called power entrepreneurship, when ban bandits, mafia, was basically uh, fulfilling the role of the state in um, managing conflicts between entrepreneurs, etc., etc. Uh, I think that legacy is still there. Bandits by now are in overwhelming majority at the cemeteries. Uh, very few of them uh, are in jail. Very few of them are in a state Duma in more or less equal proportions. Uh, but uh, this power brokerage is still there, but it is monopolized by uh, power structures, uh, federal security services and um, internal affairs ministry. <coughs> Police and uh, what was previously called KGB. Uh, now, one of... So, only one quintal, the top 20%, by 2007, lived better than in 1989. That is the story of Russian problems with capitalism. And now we come to Russian problems with democracy. Uh, and we shall come from one electoral campaign to another electoral campaign to see how we were uh, basically uh, ruining this democratic impulse and democratic emotion which was so obvious in perestroika years. Uh, we can start in 1991, when Russia, for the first time, had presidential elections. Uh, the leader of the race, future President Boris Yeltsin, uh, refused to participate in debates with uh, rivals. Uh, and since that time, Never the guy who was designated to win the elections participated in <coughs> debates. So debates were transformed from an instrument uh, of competition during elections into a kind of uh, um, entertainment, compensatory entertainment for the losers. Uh, <coughs> In uh, October 1993, uh, the parliament was attacked by the army with tanks, uh, 
and that was cheered by uh, the part of political spectrum which called themselves Democrats. Uh, the attack was commanded by uh, the Minister of uh, Defense, Pavel Grachov, who a year later commanded uh, the attack of Russian army on Grozny. <coughs> the uh, constitutional referendum, which took place two months after parliament was attacked by tanks in the center of Moscow, was a fake. Uh, I mean, silently, everybody knows that the results of the referendum were manipulated. The Constitution didn't have uh, approval in the referendum. So we are living with the Constitution, which at the very beginning was compromised. Now, there is practically no good way out as with illegitimacy of big private property. I mean, you have a problem, and there are no ways to solve this problem. Uh, so if we continue uh, with these uh, electoral campaigns, uh, we go to 1995, very important year, because uh, the Yeltsin camp lost Duma elections. <clears throat> Communists got 22% of vote, 34% uh, in Duma, while uh, Yeltsin party, our home Russia, got just 10% of vote and 12% in Duma. Yeltsin, in this situation, made two decisions. Decision number one, not to build a coalition with other parties who positioned themselves as anti-communist, because it was possible to create a majority based on coalition. But the idea of coalition was buried, and it lays in the political cemetery until now. Nobody speaks, nobody thinks about coalitions in Russia since 1995. The second thing which Yeltsin did was not calling communists to form a government after elections. Instead, he said that the previous government will continue till presidential elections, which was scheduled for year 1996. So by doing that, he <clears throat> made government weak and dependent on president instead of uh, respecting the idea that government should be based on parliamentary majority. Then we have the famous campaign of 1996. Uh, within the period of preparation for this campaign, which Yeltsin entered with approximately 5% approval rate, uh, we have learned several very important things. First of all, we have got something which in Russian was called temniks, or the list of topics which was supplied to major media services from the Kremlin uh, with explanation how these topics should be addressed. Uh, to make things worse, during this period, <coughs> uh, all private TV companies, which by that time were extremely influential in Russia, engaged 100% on the side of one candidate, <clears throat> Boris Yeltsin, against Zyuganov. <clears throat> so people 
learned that private media, which were supposed to be independent and objective, are much worse than uh, state-owned communist media because they are better in quality of their propaganda effort. Uh, it was very easy not to believe communists, although approximately 90% of what they were saying was true, uh, but uh, as we learned later. Uh, but uh, all these new media establishment, which was all the time uh, positioning itself as independent, uh, freedom-oriented, freedom of press, etc., etc., basically became a propaganda machine. That is why, uh, when we reached a moment uh, when the biggest uh, independent TV company, NTV, was basically taken away from uh, its owner and creator, uh, Gusinski, nobody cared much because nobody had illusions about the, so to say, impartiality uh, and, so to say, uh, uh, common good orientation of this company. It was an instrument either of uh, state propaganda or instrument of um, conflicts uh, which were developing uh, between Russian oligarchs uh, on the one hand was Gusinski, and on the other uh, was Berezovsky, who not owned but controlled the first uh, Russian TV channel. Uh, <coughs> in presidential elections of 1996, one more very important thing happened the director of the main sociological survey institution, FTSIOM, Alexander Oslon, <coughs> who is still director of this institution, became a member of President Yeltsin's electoral team. And <coughs> since that time, uh, main uh, sociological institutions are seen more like an instrument of shaping public opinion rather than uh, studying public opinion. Uh, now, in what we got in 2000, which is a significant year, we got three things. One thing everybody remembers, Putin became president. Uh, one more thing, Chechen war was won. The third thing, oil prices went up. And the economic situation started to improve. <clears throat> so what I'm telling you is that most of the damage about Russian relation to democracy and Russian understanding of how capitalism works was done in 1990s before Putin came to the office. Which does not mean that further damage didn't appear later. <laughs> uh, in 2003, we had elections in which <clears throat> For the last time, two democratic parties, uh, which were active since Perestroika, the Gaidar party and uh, Yabloko, the Yavlinsky party, participated in elections, but they saw their main task in undermining each other's effort. As a result, none of them made it to Duma, and since that time, this, so to say, continuity of democratic party politics was broken in Russia. Uh, Yevlinsky 
participated in the latest presidential election. I think he deserves a special mention because uh, he had taught Russian political world something new uh, during years 2000, having lost all campaigns in which he participated. He <clears throat> still, until now, controls his party. Sometimes he puts as a leader of the party, his puppet, one or another, a figure which is extremely uncharismatic and unpopular. If you want to learn where from President Putin got this idea about giving presidential position to Medvedev, ask Yavlinsky. Uh, now, the mo so the moment of truth comes in 2008. This is the presidential election in which Putin steps aside and Medvedev is elected president. The rate of participation is higher than in two previous presidential elections of Putin. And the percentage of support for Medvedev is the same as with uh, Putin, which means one thing. The society is absolutely prepared for quick and easy deal with the existing power. Whomever you offer us as your candidate is going to get his 78%. It was not clear in 2008, because that was the elections in which Kremlin, unofficially of course, forbade all the existing parties to run their first figures as candidates in presidential elections. So Medvedev was competing with some very funny figures. I mean, even more funny than the usual candidates. Uh, so, again, we are here with this practically uh, collapse of these democratic hopes and illusions. And that brings me to my two last points. As you might have noticed, uh, I have never mentioned the West in this story. So uh, I've told you how Russians managed it themselves. I mean, creating this uh, enchantment with capitalism and democracy. But capitalism and democracy is about the West. So briefly, what it means about Russian perception of the West. I think, and here I am finally on a safe ground as historian. Uh, we are in a very important, crucial moment when the paradigm of Russian thought and Russian identity building changes. <clears throat> because if we look at the 18th, 19th century, and then at perestroika years, all Russian thought is Eurocentric. Uh, people who are usually described in uh, uh, textbooks as pro-Western and anti-Western Slavophiles and Westernizers are both typical Western schools of thought. One is liberal, another is conservative. Uh, it was only in 1869, after Crimean War, after uh, experience of Russia with the Polish uprising and European reaction to this uprising and support of the Polish rebels, that in 1869, a kind of a 
bit strange freak person, Nikolai Danilevsky, published his book, Russia and Europe, in which he argued that Russia and Europe are two different but also hostile civilizations. But this is also very Eurocentric, <coughs> as you can imagine. <coughs> so if you look at how Russians were thinking about their place in the world uh, during perestroika years, Gorbachev formulated this idea of becoming a member of the family of civilized nations. And the majority supported this idea, and this idea was understood as some sort of common space, <coughs> common life with Europe. Uh, I think that uh, the understanding that it doesn't work became clear like in 2011, maybe, 2012. Uh, and partly due to this understanding, Putin decides to come back to the presidential chair. But after 2014, uh, basically we have arrived at the point when uh, big narratives collapsed or changed, if you wish. So in the West, Russia finally got back to her role of barbarian at the gate, previously being in the role of uh, eternal apprentice, somebody who all the time studies, but never studies enough. Uh, in Russia, uh, it was a clear understanding that uh, there is no common agenda. All these common spaces, uh, security space, uh, uh, humanitarian space, economic space, they all are gone. Uh, but here we come to a crucial moment, and it is not clear how Russian mind reacts to this, because there is a very serious danger, which still is a danger, it is not a reality, uh, that uh, we go along the old habit to Danilevsky. We didn't go get this common family, okay, then hostile civilizations. But I think that we do have a chance, and this chance is, how to put it, uh, it's not a hope. Uh, I study history, so I'm not optimist. Uh, uh, but it is kind of reality. Uh, I see people who are thinking this way. Uh, estrangement instead of confrontation. Uh, uh, when I called my policy paper this way two years ago, uh, many people couldn't understand what I was talking about. The idea is that, okay, we lost common agenda. Uh, instead of engaging in confrontation all the time, instead of uh, mutual trolling, which takes place all the time, let's create a kind of a neutral space, let's calm a little bit, and try to formulate new positive agenda which is going to be non-Euro focused, in which sense? Russian people, and sociology shows that, not sociology by Oslon, but by Oslon also, uh, that Russians stopped imagining their future with a focus on Europe. This is very important difference if you compare to all countries of Western Europe. 
basically when people in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova uh, think about their future, uh, they see that they have problems, uh, sometimes grave problems, and they believe that these problems are going to be solved when they join Europe. How it happens, God knows. Uh, <clears throat> but in Russia, nobody thinks this way anymore. <clears throat> so, uh, and that is the moment of optimism for me. So, having told you all this very uh, uh, spirit-strengthening stories, now I'm going to end on the uh, optimistic <laughs> note. Uh, so, Russians are done with illusions. All sorts of illusions. Which is, in my view, a very good thing. Because instead of becoming a kind of frustrated uh, and uh, concentrated on this stories, who promised what to Gorbachev uh, during German unification, etc., etc., uh, everybody is thinking about future. And uh, the way people think about future uh, allows for some sort of optimism. First of all, due to the centennial anniversary of revolution, everybody, every sociological survey was checking what is the attitude towards revolution. There is a strong, very strong, over 90% strong, uh, anti-revolutionary consensus. It is so good, in my view. Uh, uh, number two, mm, people are not disengaged in social terms. In big cities, and basically we are coming to mm, the civilization which is focused on big cities, uh, Approximately 70% of grown-up population in the age between 30 and 50, so the most important age, participate in some charity activities. 70%. It used to be 10% 10 years ago. So when people know that there is no space for political activity, instead of going into sort of internal immigration, they engage socially and pretty actively. Uh, so, I mean, society is changing and in my opinion, changing in right direction. And uh, finally, uh, the heroic spirit uh, of irredentism, which some Germans might, might remember from late 30s, <clears throat> which somehow surfaced in Russia uh, during this annexation of Crimea, uh, didn't last long. Because the biggest danger, the biggest temptation is, of course, Russian irredentists, saving Russians in neighboring countries. I mean, uh, saving Russians is a good thing by importing Russians into Russia if they want to. Uh, but uh, saving Russians by coming to liberate the uh, eastern part of Estonia is not a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, <coughs> this agenda emerged and went down, both in the hearts and minds of people, but also in the minds of politicians. And that is a very good thing. So, uh, I will end with saying that uh, we are in a very bad situation with our relations. Uh, narratives 
negative narratives <coughs> went back. The barbarian at the gate went back, comes back. So here are we. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Germany five years ago belonged to three most positively seen nations among the Russians. Now Germany belongs to five most negatively seen. Well, this is the data from the previous year, maybe it changed, but it is there. Uh, Russians had two narratives of the German. Uh, one was a narrative of a kind of a funny German with glasses uh, who knows uh, how to make medicine or how to operate some devices and knows how to make a car which runs longer than uh, a Russian one, and so on and so forth. And Russians were very much prepared to be taught by the Germans. Uh, there are two English words uh, for that. One is taught, but the other is lectured. And uh, uh, our famous Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Lavrov, uh, once expressed a very popular mood when he told, uh, I guess it was Miliband, who the fuck you are to lecture me? And this is the mood which very much is present in the Russian society, which means that by now, the second narrative of the German, uh, in the army boots and with the Schmeisser, is back which is a very sad and negative development because Russians somehow managed to marginalize this narrative completely by 1990s and early 2000s. Now, unfortunately, it is back. So I don't expect anything good to happen in short distance future. But uh, I do hope that we have some new scenarios for uh, dealing with each other for which uh, you have to get out of the narrative which chooses between Eternal Apprentice and Barbarian at the Gate, and we have to end up with our um, unlucky uh, Euro-focused uh, um, thinking and dreams for about uh, 300 years. Somebody said uh, that the main problem of the Russians is that they're white. Uh, because if they were yellow or black, uh, the understanding that they're not European would be so easy. But being not European doesn't mean being hopeless. Uh, maybe we can uh, discover what is the real agenda in our relations. It's not the expectation. Russia is not going to be a democracy. Uh, I don't see probably, maybe except of you, uh, or any people in the room who will see Russia as a democracy. If, But... Uh, well, the whole uh, story is how democratic countries live with authoritarian countries because the idea that democracy is something which should embrace all world is uh, the same illusion as the illusion about capitalism which makes everybody richer. Thank you. <laughs>
But uh, I want to open uh, the floor uh, for any questions or comments that there might be. Yes, here in the second row. Mm -hmm. proposed by conservative uh, parties in Europe, but also in Russia, I think, uh, in a in magazine like Geopolitica, you, you may know. <clears throat> so I wonder, what is your comment on this? I mean, there's still the word Europe in it. So it seems, again, is this again an illusion? Is it again Eurocentric, or what do you think about it? Uh, <coughs> uh, to understand how new is a uh, situation today, uh, you need this historical perspective. Because the idea that Russia should distance herself from Europe <coughs> uh, was uh, present among the best Russian minds of the early 20th century. Vite, Stolypin, Roman Rosen, less known person, but very clever. They were all thinking about shifting the so say, center of gravity of Russia uh, to the east. Uh, it is very dangerous to perceive today's situation as something similar for two reasons. Reason number one when they were thinking about Russia in the 20th century, they were thinking about the country which, according to demographic forecasts, was supposed to have between three and 400 million people. And shifting balance to uh, Siberia and uh, uh, Pacific Russia, so to say, Pacific Ocean Russia, was absolutely logical thing. Plus, uh, going there, going east, was going there as a potential leader of this space. Today, Russia is 150 million, I guess, uh, and uh, basically it is very clear who is the leader and the center of this space. And this is not Russia, this is China. And uh, it's absolutely a new idea. So instead of all these uh, refurbished uh, Euro-Asianist dreams about Russian leading role, uh, we should think about our position as a country with a pretty limited uh, uh, demographic potential, not as bad as uh, German journalists tell you in a sense that uh, Russians are not dying out, or not as good maybe, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, still, uh, it's a small force uh, compared to China and Europe, and how we find our role as a uh, country uh, which participates in this uh, economic cooperation. I'm not using this funny East European um, idea of a bridge. Every country wants to be a bridge. No, it's, I mean, China and Europe don't need Russia as a bridge, but they might need Russia in many ways. Uh, and this is a new situation. Uh, that is why these old stories, old receipts, all narratives do not work anymore. Question there. Yeah, please, uh, how do you explain the turn in a Russian economy in the late 1990s, uh, beginning uh, 2000s, uh, the uh, regain of, of growth? <coughs> uh, 
Uh, uh, several things. Uh, of course, oil prices. Second, uh, the end of property wars, uh, which paralyzed uh, many very important, crucially important enterprises. Uh, what Consider, for example, this famous Khodorkovsky story. Uh, he becomes, uh, he controls this um, oil company. And the very fact that he controls it allows for much better operation. Because previously, it was all fragmented and it was paralyzed because everybody was thinking about this property wars. Uh, when you look at what happened when in 2003 he was arrested and the company was confiscated, this is also part of the story of this Russian capitalism and Russian democracy. Because Khodorkovsky was the last rich man in Russia who was financing political parties without asking for permission from Kremlin. And he was financing two parties, Yavlinsky, Yabloka Party, and Communists. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the, so to say, restart of some democratic pro uh, processes in Russia is possible when uh, uh, businessmen uh, get a message that uh, they can participate in politics without uh, following Khodorkovsky, uh, <clears throat> which is possible. Uh, but uh, this picture, the growth which, uh, so to say, compensates the losses of decline is usually much easier. But then you can see how the growth stumbles a little bit. And uh, still, um, I would say that, uh, how to put it? In this respect, we are also in a very important uh, bifurcation point because Russian economy was based on the idea that it gets cheap credit from the West. And the whole system was a system in which credit in Russia uh, costed uh, from 12 to 20 percent. And you could borrow from the West for 3, 4, 5 percent, uh, which resulted in two things. <clears throat> Thing number one, more and more Russian companies uh, were very close to become uh, foreign-owned companies. Second, uh, Russian banks uh, simply worked as uh, parasites in the uh, economic system. They borrowed cheap money, they lended uh, expensive money, and they never cared of a really constructive and responsible role in economy. And this is being changed now. Uh, well, banks, you, Germans know and Greeks know that banks are very problematic institutions. Uh, we are now uh, at the moment when cheap Western money are cut off and we have to find out where are we and what we should do. Because there is a group which thinks that, okay, 
this quarrel will end soon and this cheap money will come back again. And others who say, just leave these hopes and start thinking what you can do. And the second is understanding that uh, even when relations were good, uh, the West uh, didn't want and the Russian state didn't manage to force the West to share technological uh, solutions. This gap uh, cannot be closed whether your uh, uh, technological, uh, whether your relations are good or bad. When the relations were good, still any attempt to buy. There are two beautiful stories. One is the story, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, this um, concern which produces Airbus. Air Airbus. <clears throat> so Russians went to the uh, market and bought 5% of shares. And they said, guys, we have 5% of shares. Uh, we should get a place in the board of directors. And they heard, guys, you go back and you sell these shares because you are not going to get this place in the board of directors. And the second was the story of Opel. Russians want to, wanted to buy Opel, and they were not allowed to do that because of access to technologies. And they are not big enough as China to force companies who come to the market to share technologies. So here comes the question how you get access to technologies. Maybe you should invest in your own science a little bit, uh, but also, maybe you should trade with Chinese. Uh, not because Chinese uh, are more generous than the Westerners. I don't think so. But because you can sell Chinese military technologies, which they desperately want, for other technologies which you desperately need. But this is all this novelty of the situation. Sebastian Ford. Thank you so much uh, for your interesting talk. Unfortunately, I missed the first part, so I'm sorry if you have already answered my question, but I would like to know how you interpret the current, what we call in German, Geschichtspolitik, like the politics of memory or the politics of history, <coughs> taking into account the dealing with the revolution. I found it very ambivalent. On the one hand, the revolution made the Soviet Union a global power. On the other hand, you have this anti-revolutionary, pro-church, pro-tradition string uh, within the society. You have a very positive picture of Stalin, as far as I know, like being the great statesman, having put uh, the Soviet Union on the uh, in the Champions League, so to say. And on the other hand, you have a very repressive policy against critical historians from Mem Memorial in the latest case who deal critically with Stalinism. So what relevance does it have for Putin as a statesman and for the justification of the foreign policy of Russia? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Are you prepared for <laughs> another lecture? <laughs> uh, uh, I shall uh, try to answer uh, because I didn't deal with these issues at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, uh, I think that uh, people write a lot about these issues, and uh, here also. And to a very large extent, I would say a lot of nonsense. So let me explain how I see this situation. Uh, <clears throat> point number one. Uh, Attitude to revolution uh, is not ambivalent from on the side of uh, the state and particularly Putin. Uh, it is very clear he condemns revolution. Uh, it would be very naive 
to think that he does it only because every uh, authoritarian ruler doesn't like revolutions. I mean, it's journalism, to put it mildly. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the point is that uh, this story about revolution making Russia great uh, is now being revisioned in Russian history. Because in my view, for example, the window of opportunities for Russia was the period from 1905 to 1916, say, uh, when Russia was very much prepared for what we might call uh, economic miracle. Uh, the rate of growth was 6%, uh, a lot of cheap labor, uh, a lot of educated and uh, very innovative people in professions. Uh, some of them later became very known, for example, in states like Zvorykin and Sikorsky. Somebody uh, worked in Stalin's camps like Tupolev or Yakovlev or Korolev, for example, right? Uh, and so on. So this idea that revolution made Russia great is not dominant in Russia anymore, thanks God. Uh, now, the politics of memory towards the revolution were very clear. Uh, we do not celebrate. Uh, state said, okay, whatever you want to do, conferences, fine, uh, publications, fine. Uh, there was not a single monument opened. And Putin, during this 2017, participated in opening of three monuments. One was to the victims of Stalinist repressions, which means that your story about Stalin being very popular uh, is borrowed from German journalism. Uh, second, uh, 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 the monument to Alexander III, who has this narrative of being this proper Russian Tsar, who was not uh, doing any wars, by the way, uh, and who was the first one to have a beard after Peter. So going monarchy going national. And the third one was the monument in Kremlin Restoration of the monument, which was brought down with physical participation of Vladimir Lenin. And that was the monument on the place where Grand Duke Sergei was killed uh, by assassin, uh, revolutionary assassin, uh, in 1905, I guess. Uh, so uh, it is very clear that the state did very well in 1917. On the one hand, it showed what they think about it. On the other hand, they didn't allow this centennial anniversary to become a civil war of memory. Because still people feel very much connected to this in various ways. I think that when you ask people even of my generation, uh, the majority would say that I wouldn't be possible without revolution in a sense that it was such a mixture of remix of people who would never meet in pre-revolutionary Russia, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, Russian state memory politics are opportunistic. Uh, the purpose is not uh, to establish one single narrative. The purpose is to control the field. That is very important. Because only 
understanding that, we can realize how come that presidential administration at the very same time financed writing, well, modestly pro-Stalinist textbook by Danilov and writing fiercely anti-communist, monarchist, uh, which was supposed to be also a textbook but failed to become, uh, uh, two volumes by Zubov. I mean, the same presidential administration at the same time financed two absolutely mutually exclusive narratives. What does it mean? That means that it's not that we want one narrative, but we want control over this field. Uh, now they learned how to do this. They were pretty late compared to other post-communist countries, but now they learned how to do that. So they engaged church and they created a whole set of NGOs which are, of course, Russian-style NGOs, <clears throat> which deal with memory. Russian Historical Society, Russian Military Historical Society, and so on and so forth. So we are active participants in European memory wars. Uh, we have also lost here and the, so to say, symbol of our loss is the uh, day of commemoration of the victims of totalitarian regimes, because it is August 23rd. Uh, but I think that it's not only Russian loss, but it is also the loss of Europe. Because uh, European memory culture, which was based on, uh, on, on seeing Holocaust as the founding myth and the unique, uniquely important event, is now replaced or attempted to replace by this narrative of totalitarian uh, victims, uh, which means that in the previous narrative, uh, the role of victim uh, could not have been claimed by uh, European nations. It belonged to the victims of Holocaust. And the story of European nations was how they were discovering, how they were participating in this uh, crucially important European event. Uh, and old Europe failed to impose this memory culture on the new Europe. Rather, new Europe imposed their design of memory culture on the old Europe. And welcome to the new brave world. <coughs> Ute Frevert. I really feel tempted now to um, engage in a very controversial discussion with you about memory politics <laughs> and the new or old Europe. But my original question actually refers to what you were talking, what you were saying about the long-standing um, Eurocentrism of Russia and how this basically collapsed and is now being turned into whatever estrangement. I remember very well that Mikhail Gorbachev was always using this notion of the uh, large European house, mansion, whatever. Uh, he <coughs> probably, definitely, didn't mean uh, by house the European Union, but something else. Now, this something else, uh, how, did, how has this fared in Russian uh, politics or thought or visions or 
maybe even illusions. What I see today is that the Russian government has a very strong interest and follows, that, follows this interest very forcefully to destroy um, the European Union from within by mm -hmm. supporting, uh, giving assistance to all these anti-European parties in Europe proper. So they're all doing their pilgrimage to Moscow, Marine Le Pen and the IFD and whoever. Uh, so, where do you see this notion of, of a Europe that might not be the European Union, but something else now? Mm -hmm. And another, um, the second question was about, you're talking about civil society emerging now and being very, very strong in, in uh, Russian cities by people being invo becoming involved in charity proje uh, projects, etc. I remember that there was a time in the first decade of the 21st century, by the end of that decade, when there was another type of civil society emerging in Russia. Protests of people, uh, local people, who uh, kind of went against transforming large stripes of forests into uh, construction uh, sites, etc., etc. And I, rem I also remember very strong movements, um, local regional movements, some urban, some not, with very poignant slogans like, uh, we are not cattle, we don't want to be treated like cattle by our government. And then Crimea came, and then Ukraine came, and all of this collapsed. And Putin staged himself as this kind of strong, uh, strong man, in terms of foreign policy, and he does that, has done that ever since. Do you see a connection between diverting attention from domestic problems by kind of uh, pursuing a, foreign, a very aggressive pol a foreign policy? Because you say, well, there is no longer any irredentism. That might be true, but the sense of Let's fight the syndrome of humiliation. Let's fight. Let's be. Let's be strong again. It does, which role does that play in domestic policy? Uh, okay, uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, I have a, a pretty different vision from yours. Uh, I would, if I follow your logic, I would say that uh, Europe. Uh, uh, and Americans uh, started uh, their attempts to destroy Russia much earlier than Russia started their attempts to destroy EU by contacting uh, oppositional politi politicians in Russia. Uh, if you believe that that is a uh, mm, sufficient explanation of what is being done by Russians in uh, their European politics, what can I do? Uh, I don't think that it is in Russian interest to destroy Europe. I don't think that people who are making politics uh, think that it is in Russian interest to destroy Europe. I mean, European <coughs> Union. <coughs> and I think that they are right that it is not in Russian interest. Uh, what is in Russian interest uh, is uh, in, in my view, might have been to support forces who uh, would claim that uh, there should be end to sanctions and all this stuff. Uh, these forces are legitimate participants in uh, European political process. Uh, if you support them legitimately, uh, fine, nothing bad. Although, I think this is wrong politics, because uh, too many people in Europe believe in what you believe, that Russia wants to destroy European Union. Mm -hmm. In this situation, what can you do? Distance yourself. Just distance yourself. Let people come. Some people do believe in it. Some people use Russia as a universal explanation of European problems. Yes. Brexit uh, was manipulated by Kremlin, etc., etc. Uh, 
you are living through a very serious set of crises, uh, and Russia is a very marginal factor in this set of crises uh, in Europe. Uh, so your Russia centrism in anal analysis of European crisis, I think, is not more productive than Russian Eurocentrism. Uh, now, protest. Uh, the protest you talked about is still there uh, because uh, protests against uh, uh, destroying forests for water route uh, uh, is now replaced by a protest about this uh, uh, fabrics and all this stuff ecological issues. <clears throat> and that is very important because mm, ecological issues and social conflicts are based to uh, mm, lack of uh, mm, payment uh, of salaries, etc., etc. These are the protests which uh, mobilize really big forces. Uh, Do you want to call it civil society? I always have problem with uh, attempts to use uh, uh, notions and concepts which apply to Western societies uh, to non-Western societies. Because this is the discourse about what we lack in comparison to develop uh, Western societies. Uh, we have, I mean, as social scientists, uh, we are familiar with these stories for a very long time, and there is a whole literature about whether it is legitimate and whether it is productive. Uh, I don't like the concept of civil society uh, because, not because it doesn't refer to any reality. But let us take a very clear example. Is civil society necessarily liberal? Mr. Orban had shown you that not. If you think that he lacks authentic support of civil society in Hungary, you are in a big mistake. He does have this support. So how civil society can be instrument and form of illiberal mobilization? So uh, I think that uh, looking for civil society in Russia, OK, uh, maybe we can find some other concepts for that, which mm, make it more, which are more relevant for understanding what is going on. Last two questions, one over here. Thank you very much. Um, I was surprised but also saddened by what you mentioned about Germany being held in such low regard and particularly the return of the sort of former image of an aggressive and overbearing and perhaps even expansionist country. Um, in the first instance, I'd be curious, what is this really based on? Because I imagine that in German this is demoscopie, and I suppose in English it would be demoscopie. Uh, it doesn't really exist by way of getting, represent, getting views from a representative sample of the population, so whose views are those and where do they emerge? And most of interest to me is what do they attach to? Because in my own perception, Germany is neither a militaristic nor an expansionist country. And if anything, I could see that in an authoritarian country, a country that's as individualistic 
as Germany would be uh, even despised for being weak and sort of not being able to uh, mobilize itself in support of its own national interests. So could you please expand a bit on this and also say whether there is anything in German-Russian relations that could be done to counteract this tendency? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, to begin with, uh, this is not this negative narrative of German to, in today's Russia is not narrative connected to a uh, vision of Germany as expansionist and militaristic power today. It is operating <clears throat> with the narrative of German atrocities during the Second World War. <clears throat> uh, It is uh, part of a very big and complicated uh, Russian problem. Because uh, when Russians lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the majority believed that uh, they are not liked because they are red, because they are communists. Then they discovered gradually that they are not liked because they are Russians, uh, particularly in the neighboring countries, because they were not treated quite nicely uh, in many of these countries. Uh, and then uh, Germany was seen as a kind of a, a solution to all these problems, in which sense? Germany was almost an ideal partner in this imagination of Russians. A serious, strong, reasonable force, which is prepared to interact in this uh, partnership for modernization story. Russians also hope that it will talk to East Europeans and explain that they should temper their anti-Russian emotions, uh, and so on and so forth. I can give you one example of how it was seen. Um, Volkswagen constructed a plant uh, in Kaluga, and they hired Russians uh, to work and they needed instructors. And this is the symbol for me of naivete and lack of knowledge about Russia in Germany. Uh, they decided that the best people whom they can find to serve and, as instructors and supervisors for this process would be uh, checks from Škoda, which they also owned. So they imported Czechs who simply ended up beaten by Russian workers uh, and later were replaced by East Germans, which worked absolutely smoothly uh, for a very simple, well, many reasons, but you can imagine. Now, <clears throat> when it turned out that all these hopes for better understanding and cooperation don't work. And it don't work, didn't work because Germans didn't understand Russians, Russians didn't understand Germans, they didn't understand uh, German rationale in, well, not going unilateral within the European Union, which was a big disappointment and disenchantment for us, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, then both sides have disappointments. And you end up in a situation when these disappointments are expressed and when narratives become extremely 
aggressive uh, on both sides. And I would argue, and this is a very aggressive statement, but I would argue that German narrative of Russia today is more aggressive than Russian narrative of Germany. Uh, I will give you one example. Uh, several years ago, uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung published an article under the following title. I don't remember how it sounds in uh, uh, Germany exact in German exactly, but the title was "Russia uh, is not a bear; it is a pig which fresses her children." Uh, I talked to the author of this article, and he was trying to argue that it was not the title which he gave to the article, but the editorial board, which even works better for my argument. You cannot imagine Russian newspaper of the sort comparable to Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. I mean, I mean, uh, well, decent, or allegedly decent, whatever you think about it. Uh, who would publish an article under something, a title like this, you see? So when both sides live through disenchantment uh, and all this negative emotion, uh, what we end up with? Uh, Russian uh, journalists and public figures starting telling the stories, which may be true, partly true, because, for God's sake, we know that Germans didn't behave nicely uh, in Russia in 41 or 42. Uh, there was a discourse about encapsulation of this. Okay, this is something which is kind of not typical, but you can also make it typical. It is discursive strategies. Frau Merkel with this mustache uh, was not invented by the Russians, but by the Greeks, if I remember correctly, by the Greek press. So this mechanism is not specifically Russian. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I had been hoping to get in the last question, but I think uh, we've I, absolutely exhausted our time budget. We can take it and they can t answer very briefly. No, no, I think we need to uh, draw this to a close. Uh, I think uh, we simply have run out of time. We're already 10 minutes above the time limit that I was given. So um, but thank there you. But a chance to... Well, we can always, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much.